Um, I wanted to spend one of the slots giving you a snapshot of the sort of things we can do um, and the fact that they do work. At the heart, they have the same mechanics as we have saw right at the beginning of the very first lecture. Um, so we do very similar things in similar ways. But clearly the mathematical machinery of proof becomes uh, more cumbersome and that's clearly outside the scope of this course. But I, want, I did want to show you um, the type of problems that we, um, we can work with uh, and see the kind of robust things we can do that are aligned with grand challenges and aligned with the need to tackle these big overarching societal problems which will undoubtedly be a core part of the agenda for the coming years. What I'm doing in this last session, and you'll be glad to, to know that it isn't, um, it isn't uh, mathematical really at all. Um, uh, a lot of the mathematics is at the, the level we, we have seen, certainly in the second uh, presentation I'll give. There'll be two presentations relating to two different biological systems. I say they're different. Actually, they have a lot of similarities. Um, the similarity is that both of these studies relate to our immune system. The immune system is the thing that keeps us well. It's the thing when I come to a new environment, traveling to Rocky, there are different illnesses here than there would be in London. Um, my immune system is the thing that is able to keep me well, respond to the changes, and make sure I stay healthy. Clearly, for some people, the immune system um, does not work in all situations. There can be a number of reasons for this, and we will look at a couple of, of cases. The first one is we're looking at psoriasis. This is actually um, a, an immune-related disease. So it is something that relates to the immune system effectively responding to something in a bad way. So the immune system doing something as a response, which is not what, is, what it is required. It is called autoimmune disease, when effectively the immune system turns on the body and does something undesirable, usually because someone has some sort of either hereditary or um, other um, uh, disease or, 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 or problem, of which psoriasis is a particular one. The second study relates to HIV, uh, when um, the immune system is unable to operate um, as, as, it, as it should. Why this focus on the immune system and immune-related diseases? Well, because at the heart of the immune system, we know there are switches, okay? And so just as in our lectures here, we know that switches are good. We've seen that they're robust. You've seen that they give good performance. In, um, in the immune system, we see a switch control system which can be highly robust, that's highly energy efficient. And we look at it and we see, first of all, can we learn from it? Are the things in this complex system, which are human beings, populations of human beings, that uh, uh, where we know that populations of human beings can impact on spread of disease. This is another important uh, dynamic, if you like. That is the, uh, at, at, at a different level, a different scale, whether it's at the individual, whether it's at the cell, the population of cells, or the population of human beings. The immune system impacts. Um, can we learn from these these systems about how we design controllers, um, but also can we contribute? 
Is our knowledge of switch control and our knowledge of control in general able to give insight into how these diseases progress, why they uh, are as the way they are, and why particular drug treatments may or may not work well for a particular individual. At the heart of all of this is a drive towards personalized medicine, between knowing what we, at the moment, um, and it probably sounds a very strange thing to say, but really most medicines are like a really conservative control. You're given a dose. I may be given the same dose. Likelihood is we don't need exactly that dose, but we're given a big dose, which is a bit like having a really high-gain control system. So they're highly conservative. And with some of these things, for example, we see with antibiotics, we give these very big doses, and then people become resistant to these drugs. So big doses of anything probably isn't a good idea. The kind of doses that, that's needed is a good idea. There are also areas, and, and this was a big motivation for our study of psoriasis, where some drugs work incredibly well for some individuals and don't at all for, for, for others. Um, psoriasis was a case in point where there was a new generation of biologic drugs. For some individuals, it was a miracle cure. You know, the, the scales on their skin disappeared. They were able to go back to living a normal life, which is fabulous. But for other people, they would take exactly the same drug, and it would have zero effect. They would be just the same, as they were before they took the, the drug. These biologic drugs, certainly in the UK, were very expensive. So uh, our National Health Service is always concerned about the amount of money it, 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 it needs to spend. Spending money on drugs which don't work for some people is not something it, it wants to do. So there is there was a financial imperative Rightly or wrongly, I'm not here to defend that or otherwise, but there was a financial imperative on these very expensive drugs as to why they didn't work so that you would be able to, to know who to give them to. Um, but the second is it's quite devastating for the individuals that belong to that class for which they don't work. They see people that te technically have the same problem and the drugs just don't work for them. So their quality of life, their problems stay. And so that psychologically is a huge problem for those individuals. And talking to clinicians, clinicians said, well, we can't tell. We look at these patients and everything we look at seems the same. So we don't know. There's nothing we can see in either of these patients um, that would say why patient A it would be successful, and why for patient B, it wouldn't. And initially, a big data approach was tried. We talked about this intelligence, big data. There's a massive project called PSORT. I think it's still ongoing, put together by the drug companies, various universities, the health service, to try and collect data on people who have psoriasis, people who don't have psoriasis, and try and work out why, what was special about the people for whom the drug treatment was successful, and what was special for the people for whom the drug treatment didn't work at all. And this, just like the doctors, to the last I saw, unless something's happened uh, very recently, didn't yield anything at all. There was nothing coming through looking at that data saying, ah, we know this happened to these people or this is a characteristic of these people. So nobody knows why these biologic drugs 
are successful for some people and not for other people. And they'd really like to know why. So what we got involved in um, was uh, a study to try and look at psoriasis to do a bit of systems thinking on it, to try and see if we could learn something about psoriasis from um, our knowledge of um, discontinuous um, control theory. So I'm going to say a little bit about psoriasis um, uh, initially, and I'm going to show that it really is a complex network. The problem with talk, it's a real problem making these presentations in this area because if I go and talk to medics and biologists, which I do, they know nothing about control. Typical biologists in the UK never studied any maths after age 16. So for them, control is, is tricky, you know. Uh, I come and talk to control engineers, certainly in the UK, and engineers about this. Often, they didn't study any biology since they were 16 either. So we have a real problem in these interdisciplinary spaces because the language is really difficult. We often just have part of the language. So the will, and bearing in mind for some of you, English is certainly not your first language. It makes it even more difficult. So um, um, bear with me. Um, I'll make the key points. There will be some things on the slides which you can take in or not depending on your background in biology but it shouldn't detract from being able to understand uh, uh, what we're doing. But we will say a little bit about our modeling approach that we use. Um, we didn't do the modeling. Some mathematical modelers who work with biologists did it. Because likewise, my biology um, is, is, is not uh, uh, at a high level. It's higher than it was since I started to work in this area, but it's still not up to doing biological modeling of these very, very complex systems. And then we'll have a little look at a control systems um, perspective on the problem. Now, psoriasis is a chronic inflammatory skin disease. Millions of people um, in the world are affected by it. And they're affected to varying degrees. So some people may just have a little patch of skin, which is problematic, um, flaky. Um, clearly, um, they aren't. It, that's not desirable. It's not nice for them. But they may well be able to carry on working, um, interacting, just as we are. In for some people, it, they can have it all over their body, really bad, uh, 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 flaking away of, of all the skin on their, their body. So, what, um, what do we have? This here represents a layer of skin. And we're effectively going to think of having two, three types of cells. The red ones here, which are a layer on the skin, uh, uh, a layer in the skin, uh, and two types of skin, uh, other cells, that interact with them. And we'll say a little bit more about those three types of cells and what they do uh, at the moment. The problem, or what's thought of the, is the potential problem, and is certainly at the heart of potential cures, are these things called cytokines. And it's thought to be effectively a breakdown in the cytokines that causes um, psoriasis. So basically, um, rather than signaling um, a healthy growth rate of skin, you can think of them almost as being like out of control and growing far more skin than you need to grow so that it's, it's flaking away um, uh, 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 in that way. People who are severely affected are affected not just physically but psychologically. You know, it would affect the, 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 you know, just looking at someone. You would see them. They would be very different. They, would, they might feel awkward. Um, and it's also incredibly painful, so difficult to manage. 
So both physically but also psychologically, it's difficult to cope with. You can't see it very well, but that's a, that's a picture of skin with psoriasis. So the red here, there, um, patches are scaly patches due to these cytokines effectively being out of control. And you can see the difference here from healthy skin to skin with psoriasis. You see the flakes here coming off here, which are usually called scales, plaques that are embedded in the skin, and then the inflamed skin here. And you can see the problem, this layer here, is really out of control compared to here. You know, we've got a much fatter layer here um, where these cytokines are not effectively regulating the growth and development of the skin. So we can think of cytokines as being like an actuator, okay? And effectively, drug treatments, and certainly these biologic drug treatments, fundamentally what they try and do is they try and um, actuate particular cytokines. So you can think of the drug treatment as effectively being like a control signal that's applied to an actuator, which is a cytokine that tries to mediate this growth. And particular biologic drugs target particular cytokines. So trying to get them to behave in particular ways. So it's a bit like a control problem. It might not look like a classical control problem, but effectively, in a human like me, when I've got a healthy immune system, I have good feedback control in that immune system. I have switches that are working incredibly well, and I'm very lucky to be healthy. In someone with psoriasis, their immune system is not working well. It is, attack it is attacking their own cells, so it is doing undesirable things with the cells of the individual, causing them, in a simplistic way, to grow at a, a much greater rate. So they have a deficient feedback control. The drug treatment is like an outer loop, an additional feedback control. So the drug treatment is a feedback control that is trying to mediate the, the, the cytokines. Um, so it's like an outer loop um, control system. So we were interested in trying to understand how the system responds to these biologic therapies, to try and understand why, for some people, it's fine, and they go from a diseased equilibrium to uh, a normal equilibrium, um, which fundamentally is what, what it's about. Um, and why, for some, it doesn't. And you've got to, um, for, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting point to note. The immune system is incredibly robust, okay? So the healthy, steady state is incredibly robust. If you are one of an individual with an autoimmune disease, whereby you don't live in that healthy equilibrium of the immune system, think of it as living in another equilibrium. That equilibrium is also highly robust. Okay? Which is why these diseases are re these autoimmune diseases are really quite difficult to eradicate because you think, well, this is a control problem. Why don't I move from this unhealthy equilibrium to this healthy one? Well, the problem is that's really difficult to do. And you've only got to look at some of the drug treatments that are used for psoriasis to know why. Many of them are pastes and creams. They make the swell, they make it less bad. So in effect, they're affecting the region it operates in. They are not able to move it to the healthy equilibrium. And so for some of these very extreme diseases, it's not like getting a cold where we can you know, something uh, we can uh, get better and move back to a healthy equilibrium is much more difficult 
and indeed many of the drug treatments historically have been about making that equilibrium, um, in, in this case, less inflamed, easier to manage, not getting rid of it. So, you know, you read the uh, medical literature, it says, you know, if you have these things, you're likely to have them for the rest of your life. This is the beauty of the biologic therapies because they actually do move the equilibrium. So, and this is a very powerful thing to do. If medically we can move equilibria, then we can be very powerful on the lives of individuals in terms of um, giving them better qualities uh, of life. And so the other thing is that if we have better knowledge, then we can... Um, be more cost effective. You know, we can decide, should this patient have this drug treatment? We don't have to wait six months, a year to see if it works or not. We know straight away what's the optimal thing and the optimal dose as well that, that, that hopefully will come. So we don't have this very conservative. And it's not, not me. Uh, I went to a meeting with a lot of clinicians and it was a clinician that, that told me about this, uh, and when you think about it, it makes sense that effectively they know that they over, you know, they that drug that drug treatments are at high levels because that's when most people get well. They, they're not prescribing for an individual; they're prescribing at a level to get everyone. So it's like a very conservative controller. So the three types of cells we have in here. I just say I won't labor, but just so you know the, the, the notation. The first are the, ker uh, uh, the keratinocytes. These are the ones that are known to form the plaques, and they're much of the um, tissue in the epidermis, the skin layer here. T cells, which relate to our immune system, so T cells are, are, are often incredibly good things. It's the T cells we'll see in the HIV. Um, study, um, they circulate in the body, um, uh, 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 hopefully doing good things, but um, sometimes doing less uh, good things. And then, if things go wrong, and then dendritic cells, which we know produce um, cytokines. Now, that's only three cell types, and I think you can say, just even if you don't know anything about biology, you'd be very, very surprised that there were only three cell types. There's lots of other cell types, natural killer cells, ma macrophages. The issue with some of these uh, other cells is even the biologists don't know what they do. So for anything where there wasn't biological strong evidence for what it did in this psoriasis domain, we ignored it. So... It's much more complicated than the three cell types we've got here. We recognize that, but at least it's a start. All these loops are different cytokines. So you can see these are different actuators. So there are, there are many, many ways in which these cells act on each other. So they either activate or they inhibit um, cell production, um, and um, there are lots of them. So how did we cope with that? We clearly couldn't have three cells and deal with all of these. What we did was we split the problem down and just looked at the impact of the cytokines that the biologic drugs were, were targeting. Because that seemed, you know, the... the, the, me, the, you know, the um, the drug companies had identified these cytokines as being good candidates to be actuators to, um, in, to, to, um, to, if you like, respond to psoriasis. And so we used the same ones they were targeting in our analysis. But as you can see, there are loads more. And we don't really know how. You know we're not biologists. We don't know how, but we chose some uh, that were um, once targeted by the drug companies. So we wanted to know, can we develop a system model that incorporates known behavior? Does it have a normal steady state? Does it have a steady state 
that corresponds to psoriasis. So can we model, and clearly it is a system, you know, it isn't that someone with psoriasis and someone without psoriasis is, are different, they're both human beings, so we needed to be able to see a model um, that was a single model that could have both steady states um, depending on the cytokines. And then the second question we wanted to ask was, well, if we could find that model, can we do some control analysis where we regard the cytokines as actuators um, so that we could look at what happens to the cell population under the assumption that cytokine dynamics are faster than the cell dynamics? And that's typically what we do with, say, an aircraft. Very rarely when we design an aircraft do we include the actuate the um, dynamics of all the actuators. You know, we're, um, we might test um, in, in, in that domain, but typically we wouldn't use them. So we're saying, well, the cytokines are actuators, like my aircraft actuators. They will have dynamics, but I'm assuming that's much, much faster than how the cells are, are, are behaving themselves. So we made... Um, some, or rather our, our biological collaborators, made some assumptions on um, the biology, which I've put there for completeness. Um, so uh, one, is, is, the first assumption is around the types of activity that impact on our system, which is cell migration, proliferation, differentiation, and apoptosis, where apoptosis effectively means cell death when cells die. The rate of migration is independent of the local concentration, whereas the, late, the rate of proliferation and differentiation is dependent on the existing population. And cell death is a, a stochastic event at the level of individual cells. Back to something we can perhaps recognize and I deliberately haven't put lots of things in there. Um, fundamentally, it says that each cell population roughly looks like this. Okay? So each cell population will have some dynamics, um, which uh, uh, will depend on the rate of increase in the cell population X. We will have something here. Um, uh, a linear term where, uh, which is governed by the rate of increase by the cytokine-mediated um, differentiation uh, uh, and proliferation events. C is the net rate of increase, uh, sorry, net rate of decrease in X due to the cytokines um, killing um, particular cells. And mu X represents um, the effects of additional cell death due to non-modeled processes. So lots of things affecting that cell dynamics. So what we could do is based on that interaction diagram that I wrote, the one with all the cytokines flowing around, um, we can look at what happens at the level of each of those three population, uh, 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 cell populations. Um, and we used a particular, or we didn't use it, the team used um, a particular um, modeling approach from biology. So this was an approach they had used to model other biological um, phenomena. As I said, we, um, we looked at, uh, uh, at uh, um, different um, cytokines, so you could have the different cytokines contributing to the same process, but having different effects. And we modeled this as a multiplication of terms. So you can have something where one cytokine causes the cells to proliferate, another cytokine causes it to inhibit. Well, the net effect, we multiplied the two together. So within this framework, these functions here, so all the Fs, are potentially nonlinear things, okay? As are the Gs. So we've got lots of nonlinear functions here. 
from the interaction diagram, we can see which of the populations impact on, on, on each other. Um, so um, we were, it was possible to write down uh, a low order, so in some senses, relatively straightforward models, but relatively complex, potentially nonlinear model of the cell um, dynamics. One of the things we wanted to do was to focus on psoriasis. We knew what we wanted to do. And so what we did was we focused down only on four cytokines at any point in our study. So for all those interactions we had, we looked at the key ones, and they were, as I said before, um, determined from the impact of what we knew drug companies were doing. So drug companies were looking at these cytokines um, as for therapeutic uh, development of therapeutic tre treatments. We assumed they were actuators. And I'm only going to consider one. I'm going to consider when IL-23 is the actuator. Um, because even just for one, we need all those parameters um, in theory. But actually, we did some simplification. We were wanting to solve it as a control problem. So we thought about a control UP. Now, this is effectively the action of a cytokine. So it isn't really something that we may be in a position to design. So it, it, we don't want to think of it as a design control. But it's certainly an injection that's being um, given. Okay? So the effects of IL-23 on K were lumped into this single parameter, which we call UP, which we can think a bit like uh, a control signal. The thing... So for us, it's the thing we're trying to actuate to see what happens. If you look at the IL-23 diagram, you can see that the, the system simplifies a, a great deal from that hugely complicated one we had at the start. And we had some simplifications that we took from doing a range of things. I mean, the problem with modeling biology is often a lot isn't known. Parameters that are known and things that are known are done by different experimental people under different um, uh, uh, conditions. So we did this with a mix of reading the literature, um, relying on our biological partners and, and their particular knowledge about what might make common sense. So if we consider IL-23 as an act, We've got uh, a third-order dynamic system that looks slightly more uh, sensible. We can... I'm not designing a UP, so it's, it's important to note that here. It's going to come from thinking of a, of a singular perturbation type uh, uh, argument of how the dynamics may, may behave. So we're thinking of this as potentially the cause of hyperproliferation of keratinocytes, which is what happens when someone has psoriasis. And likewise, we can think of it as an effect. It could have the potential um, um, uh, via appropriate drug, drug treatment um, to, to um, stem that hyperproliferation. But at the moment, if you like, we're effectively open loop. So we're with the system with psoriasis. So we've got the UP that we've got, and because we're interested in psoriasis, it is causing um, hyperproliferation. So if you look at what actually um, happens here, we can hypothesize a model of slow plant dynamics, fast, fast actuator dynamics with a particular kind of form that comes quite naturally for, how, for what UP is doing. So P here 
when I, when I refer to something UP, um, it effectively means the plant. So it's associated with the plant dynamics here, not associated with the actuator dynamics, which are here. Now, when we look at that modeling, what, what do we see? Well, we see that basically a cytokine has the role of a pseudo-control. So it is like a control which inhi inhibits pr proliferation um, when it is prohibited using therapies. So we know that sources of inflammation, so the source of inflammation, as I said at the start, was that uh, come from the, the D and the K, um, not from um, the um, um, T cells. So when we carry out uh, a singular perturbation analysis, because this is an actuator, we're assuming it's fast. So typically, to carry out a singular perturbation analysis, we're saying, well, these dynamics are really fast, so if I have epsilon here, I will look at what happens in the, in the limit as epsilon tends to zero and then see what impact that has on the rest of the dynamics. Um, perhaps won't go into this. So what do we have if we do this? I won't work, we, I don't think it's necessarily, but some people who know about singular perturbation analysis, that part will be trivial. If you don't know about singular perturbation analysis, this isn't the moment to, um, to learn about it. The singular perturbation analysis, as I say, just effectively takes out the actuator dynamics, assumes the derivative goes to zero, and moderates the rest of the dynamics accordingly. And so when you've done this, you end up with um, equilibria here, which do have the kind of behavior which have been suggested by the study of immunity. So the fact that these biologic drugs are um, targeting these cytokines, as you might think, these are clever people, is right. The cytokines potentially are a fast actuator. And as a fast actuator, they give us a biologically meaningful type of equilibrium for this particular cytokine, IL-23. So that was quite positive. That was the first result we had. We could show that the cytokines were acting like control, um, that they were like fast actuators, and we could formulate it as a control problem. We looked um, at, we extended our control problem now to say, well, is a finite time control perspective helpful? Um, what do I mean by that? I mean, we have talked about being able to um, deliver um, systems to zero in finite time. We talk about S going to zero in finite time, um, rather than asymptotically. Much of the control community talks about asymptotic stabilization. When we're dealing with biological phenomena, such as cell death or numbers of cells, um, it's clearly a finite time behavior. You know, there is a time when there are zero cells. They don't go in the limit tending to infinity, you know, as time tends to infinity, getting smaller and smaller and smaller, like a signal on a DC motor. So we could, the question we asked ourselves was, is a finite time control perspective helpful? Now, if you look at the model we developed, it's quite involved. And a lot of people have said about finite time control results, um, they've said, well, these are very technical. We didn't talk much about the technicalities of how we prove finite time control. 
but they're quite technical and you get, we saw in some of the things just before lunch, some, you know, fierce looking things that we have to satisfy. The, the point to note about this system is that even, it's, even as it's a, an enormously challenging problem, it maps to any of the biological problems I've considered and finite time properties hold naturally from the model. So that was the big bonus we got. So people say in all this about, it's much better to think about asymptotic stability. It's easy. You know, linear systems are easy. Biology is sophisticated. Um, it has evolved over many, many years to be highly efficient. And on, along the way, it's highly nonlinear. Um, and so what we found, and we'll see why, that finite time results that people would say, from the control perspective, who would ever use this for the overhead? You know, it's much, much more complicated. They're naturally satisfied by some of these biological systems. So um, what we expect it to happen from biology, that it's a finite time behavior, um, it actually is. So in order to study this finite time behavior in our model of psoriasis, we used a, a modified version of the michaelis menten function. If you look, it's very, very similar to the kind of switch we were dealing with. So biologists have been using this kind of, and indeed biochemists, have been using this kind of growth uh, uh, curve for years. Um, but it's exactly what we use in our smooth variable structure control. So it's, it's just exactly the same as a smooth variable structure control. Um, and so um, what we used uh, was... Uh, a non lipschitz modification of this, which would give us finite time control. Okay? Now, what is the main difference between those two functions? Well, here's the main difference. The slope at x equals 0 is infinite as it's non lipschitz whereas the second one has a slope everywhere. So here, this has uh, this one here has slope uh, has um, infinite slope so okay which is a very small technicality I would say in terms of uh, uh, the mathematics some biologists get quite excited that you know in, in a bad way when they see that we've changed changed the function. But effectively, we've just said, well, it doesn't have infinite slope. If you look at the model with corresponding non-Lipschitz growth uh, dynamics imposed so that we can actually have finite time um, stability, we can see there's almost no difference at all. Okay, so of the three cell types, there is almost no difference at all. One technical point is that alpha, which if you notice here, is what we assume in our non-Lipschitz modification, it does slightly affect the equilibria. So we could think of alpha as being some sort of constant that parameterizes convergence. I'm not going to do it, but you can prove finite time behavior. Um, these biological systems are beautiful. The results of finite time stability drop out much, much more easily than for engineering systems. And so um, we can do the, uh, I'm not going to do it here, but we can take the previous singular perturbation analysis and do it with a finite time stable actuator and get very, very similar results. So it gives, you know, coming at the problem from a completely different way in, you get consistency in the kind of uh, results obtained, which I think is usually something that is a positive indicator that we might be right. So what we did with this 
um, is we got a model, you know, so rather than all this work that was purely data driven, looking at characteristics of patients, etc., etc., to try and work out why these biologic drugs were failing. Um, we, we did get a model. One of the problems we have with this model is we need real data. You know, we need to be working with clinicians um, who can provide us with samples of numbers of cells um, in different types of patients so that we can actually parameterize the model. And in fact, for the second study I do, where we do the parameterization based on real clinical data, it works very well. And this, immu this immune system uh, uh, model, the model we've got here with the cytokines, that has very similar mathematical characteristics. So the approach I'm going to show you for um, modeling um, the second biological system would work for this. The problem we have is that we don't, uh, we don't have uh, the data. So really what we need is uh, more information. And one of the things, uh, that, that was how I first got to know Soham when he came to work with me at Kent. Some of the work we did together there showed that initial conditions might be incredibly important so that you might be in the unhealthy equilibrium, so you knew you were in the basin of attraction of that unhealthy equilibrium corresponding to that psoriasis state, but within that domain, there were some areas where it was much more desirable to be than others when it came uh, to the action of the cytokines being able to tailor the dynamics. So there were some thing, areas where it was highly invariant. So if you were at certain initial conditions, you were just pulled into the uh, unhealthy equilibrium, you stayed there. There were other regions where if your initial conditions were, and they were very slightly different, so, so very small changes in initial conditions could get very big changes in terms of the equilibrium you went to. So the, we have a potential to be able to explore how variations, very small variations in initial conditions actually could be explaining to some degree why some patients, we certainly saw it in the dynamics as to why some patients might find biologic drugs a miracle cure and why other patients um, May not. Okay, so I don't know. Have you got any questions on on that particular on that particular uh, one? This next one's less heavy with the notation, and also I think once you've done the first one, it's. Okay, so this one relates to some work that we did again on the immune system. The reason I switched in some, some respects, I mean, we started off with this psoriasis problem. I had a, a systems biologist collaborator who was very interested in the psoriasis, so that was my starting point. But having become interested in the switches I knew that I uh, wanted, um, or rather interested in these switches in biology, I've always been motivated by trying to do real things. So things that mattered rather than things that were just theoretical. Because the, the study you see, the previous one that we just presented, we got some stuff from the literature, but really we didn't have the clinical collaborators to let us have real data um, on um, cells in, in, in scaly plaques across a, a treatment which we really needed. But we could get data for the case of another immune uh, problem, which was the case 
of HIV. And there were big clinical trials, which I could get access to, um, to test the hypothesis that this is really a discontinuous control, and the discontinuous control methods we use to decide whether a sliding mode controller would converge or not, whether they could be used to tell whether a treatment would be successful for a particular patient or not, depending on measurements at the start of the treatment. Okay? So is it possible to analyze the stability of that control problem as a feedback control problem um, um, for, by adopting a variable structure approach? So, I want to remind us for a start about what is control engineering and out of our switch control paradigm. And really to show that at the heart of the immune system is a switch control. And I shall appeal to an immunological model from a survey paper, in, so it's not my model. You'll look at it and think, goodness, that could have been a model we considered in our early bits of variable structure control. It isn't my model. Just show you that the switch control paradigms are inherent. And then we'll look at prediction of the containment of HIV infection using antiretroviral therapy. And there's two key things here. We need to estimate parameters at a patient level. So fundamentally what we do is we take um, the measurements, the clinical measurements that would be taken anyway on the drug, uh, on the, um, during treatment in the first few weeks of the trial. We use those to estimate the parameters of the immune system of an individual. So then at the level of a patient, we know how their immune system is responding to the drug treatment. And based on that, having found those so we're effectively estimating a closed-loop system. Okay, so they're taking the drugs, they're having these occasional blood tests. We're using the results from the blood tests to be able to predict that the, the, the parameters of that closed-loop system. We then look at that closed-loop system and say, is it convergent or not, using a variable structure control approach. And the test was... Um, to say, um, can, we, um, can we predict what the outcome would be at the end of six months just by looking at the modeling we'd done in the first month? So we looked at the first month, modeled, got the parameters, assessed the control system, and said, can we tell what's going to happen to these patients? And we had data from two clinical trials, one that was in France, one that was in the States, both uh, uh, trials of antiretroviral um, therapy. We did tr two trials because the French trial was very small and all the patients, the drugs they were given, um, had a satisfactory outcome. So clearly, uh, and we did, we predicted a satisfactory outcome, but you know, the acid test is can you predict the cases where there isn't? So we used the U.S. trial as well, because in the U.S. trial, um, there, wasn't, um, uh, uh, there were patients for whom it, it failed, the drug treatment failed. And so we wanted to know, could, could we have said to either the patient or the clinicians, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work. So we are dealing with a closed-loop system here. So we're dealing with a closed-loop system, which is a patient undergoing drug treatment and the closing of the loop is the drug treatment so we're not designing a control we are assuming that um, we can uh, 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 we can um, assume a control if you like that is the drug treatment And we've seen lots of things about variable structure control. Um, and we've seen the robustness of sliding mode control. What we haven't seen 
is the immune system. And effectively, I'm going to show that this kind of variable structure control is at the heart of the immune system, that it's robust just like this. This is experimental data. So this is, is data that's been measured in a laboratory. The lump at the start is the virus load. So this here is the virus load. And this other curve here is the total population of CD8 plus T cells. So effectively what's happening is the system is being subjected to a disturbance, which is the virus load, and the T cells are responding to that virus load. We can see initially they don't do anything at all. You know, it's, it's, nothing happens. And this you'll find with many of these biological controllers. Very energy, energy efficient. They don't do anything unless they really need to. So they wait and see, is this a need to do something? Um, I'm not going to do anything unless I'm sure. So you see here this dead zone, where, uh, which we would recognize from control. Usually for us, we'd think this was a bad thing. We wouldn't like a dead zone. But they, they naturally have a dead zone because they're very energy conserved. And so what happens is the T cells expand to counteract uh, the infection and then contract. If you look at a model of this system, this isn't my model. This is a model from an immunological paper. F here is a switch. Okay? So the script F in here is just a switch just a discontinuity, the same as we have had in a lot of our models. We can see that the phase portrait, what happens is we initially have this huge proliferation of T cells after the initial phase of not doing anything, so it doesn't do anything, and then it, it opens up, throttles back, and a lot of T cells proliferate um, to uh, respond to the infection. And if you look at the subsystem, what it's actually doing then, the subsystem then is unstable. So it has an unstable pole. So it's wanting to operate really, really quickly. So we talked about the maneuverable aircraft yesterday. So it's actually in an unstable mode trying to overcome the infection. And then it enters a contraction and memory phase which is stable bringing the system back down. So this is an immunological model that you can analyze. I haven't put the steps in to do the stable, the contract, but take it from me, there's an unstable pole, and then the system switches, it becomes a stable system. Um, and ideally, it has a phase portrait looking like this. And that's what that model does. And if you look at what that model does, so this here is the sum of the cell populations. It looks very like the, the experimental data I put on at the start. So the shape is very, very like it. So we have um, dynamics like we had right at the start of this lecture, Oops. which um, have switches in them that switch between different types of behavior to achieve an objective. And so that's what the immune system does. My question to myself was what about happens when all this fails? So if that stable uh, motion that we have um, from this initial unstable transient, if something goes wrong with that, or something goes wrong with this unstable transient, um, what can we say about those failure cases? What insight can we give as control engineers? Now, in the literature, there are various models of HIV infection for patients undergoing antiretroviral therapy. So what we've used here is not our model. You know, we have used a model from biology. We have thought 
of u1 and u2 as being like a control. Okay? So we're thinking of the antiretroviral therapy as being like a control. We have some parameters here. And if we're going to do anything with this, we clearly need to be able to assess those parameters at the level of individuals. So if we're going to be able to do the job, as it says on the tin, about whether um, it's successful or not as an outcome, we need to be able to estimate those um, parameters. Now, what happens at the moment about this? Well, what happens at the moment is effectively these equations are linearized. So they're linearized and looked at at the steady state. Okay? So these nonlinear equations are linearized, they're looked at, and there is this static condition which is called the re reproductive ratio which is used to investigate the stability of the infection-free steady state. So it's basically saying that if this reproductive ratio, which is static, it just depends on the parameters, is less than one, then the infection-free steady state is stable, will we'll, we'll be okay. Um, but if R0 is bigger than one, then we won't. Now that is, if you think about it as a control engineer, that's okay, but that's at a single point. How can we say that that infection-free steady state, so linearized at the origin, is going to say that we're going to get there? This is a dynamic process. It's a nonlinear process. And what was happening in the literature was that people were seeing things where they were computing the reproductive ratio and it was being bigger than one and it was stable and it was being less than one and it was unstable. So they were seeing, which wouldn't surprise us because if you take a static condition based on a linearization to say what would happen to a nonlinear system, if we could do that, our job would be incredibly much easier, wouldn't it? We wouldn't have any problems at all in terms of control. Um, we would just be able to say, well, we can linear, you know, we can make any system stable if the origin is stable. You know, we, we, we know that's not true. Uh, so, so, you, so it's not a surprise that this, that this biologist, were, were, when they were using this, and bear in mind, they are not systems theorists, you know, were noticing these things because we would expect that to, we would expect that to, to happen. So, um, what we did was we looked at being able to estimate all those six parameters. Um, there had been some previous work doing this kind of thing, um, but what it did was it assumed the control was constant. So that the effect that these parameters here were constant. Okay? So any parameters relating to the control, they assume would be the same for everyone. Well, we know from what clinicians tell us that drug treatments don't work the same on everybody. You know, you don't, well, we just know when we get, sometimes we get special things, you know, we, responses to drug treatments where one individual has a bad reaction. So I don't think we can say that all of these um, should be the same. So we didn't assume that the control system was constant um, for each uh, individual to have the same effect on each individual. We assumed those parameters would vary with the individual too. To get the... Um, Parameters, we used a differential algebraic approach, um, which looks a bit heavy, but basically all that says is um, if, if we can take a, an output of the system and its derivatives and wholly um, represent the dynamics of the system just by the output 
and its uh, 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 derivatives, and indeed the input and its derivatives, then that system is algebraically identifiable. And we used this um, notion of algebraically identifiable to find the parameters, because the immune system is algebraically identifiable. So that means even for the case of psoriasis, if I could find the, somebody with the data, we could find the parameters because it's inherently algebraically identifiable. So we had two sets of measurements, and these were consistent with the data sets we had, where the one was the total number of CD8 4 plus cells um, in uh, the uh, blood uh, samples. So that was the, 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 the plot we saw. Um, and we looked for all six parameters using data measured during the first four weeks of treatment. So it's very kind of lumpy when they go, you know, so people go to the clinic, they have their blood samples taken. It's not necessarily regularly in terms of equally spaced, but typically within the first four weeks, you would get enough samples, enough measurements to be able to um, use um, the data to, to, to get some estimates of the, the parameters. And so here we can see how the first output depends on itself, its derivative, the second output, and its derivative. And so we could use that um, to generate um, some of the parameters. We were told to look at the effect of noise on the data, and this didn't have a, a problem. And in fact, we found some other studies which had done the same thing, um, uh, which showed the estimates are robust to noise. So then we started to think, once we got all the parameters, we started to think of our reachability condition. Because fundamentally, what we wanted to do was to maintain the HIV viral load below the limit of detection, effectively zero. We always say below the limit of detection because we've got a sensor me measuring it, so it measures to a certain accuracy. So that's, that's the level we know. But effectively, we could think the control objective of taking this drug is to maintain um, this load um, below the limit of detection. So we chose a switching function to try and look at the inf infection-free steady state. So in, what we want is for this S here to go to zero. And we looked at the reachability condition and we said, well, what did this drug treatment need to do if we were going to make sure the, the drug treatment effectively got the patient to that condition where their viral load was below the limit of detection. And you can find a very nice condition which has to be satisfied by the parameters. Okay? So fundamentally what we're hypothesizing is that if the parameters of a, di of a given individual computed in the first four weeks of treatment, satisfy this kind of condition based on a dynamic model. So remember, this P is varying. So P here is a state. So it, 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 it depends on P as well. So the parameters and the P coming from, from the model, including the parameters. If this is negative, forced to, ne to be negative and stay negative, then the end of the treatment, the patient will have the required viral load below the, the limit of detection. And if this doesn't hold at the end of four weeks, so for the parameters and a simulation of what's happening to P, then we hypothesize that the patient at the end of six months, so five months later, won't have attained that healthy um, steady state. So we looked at two sets of clinical trial data. Um, the first um, 
set was um, uh, the French set, um, and where all patients were successfully treated. The second set of data was the US um, data. Um, and first of all, if we look at one of the patients, um, patient three in the first trial, and we look at what, uh, what we've done here, we take data points in the interval of 30 days, so the first month, and we use this to compute the biological rates. So this is just showing you what the model says will happen to this patient. Okay? We've only used the data at the start to parameterize the model. Okay? So the data at the start has computed the parameters. And then this tells us what happens as the outcome for that particular patient. If we look at the reachability condition and what happens, here we have patient two um, in the second trial. Which patient, it was um, successful. We can see that for this patient, after an initial phase, the reachability condition becomes negative, okay? So there's an initial transient like we saw of moving onto the sliding mode. It then stays negative and remains negative. We can see why, that the one part here is that needs to be smaller than this part here is always below it. It's quite difficult to see with the resolution of the thing. The screen. In this particular case, for this patient, the reproductive ratio is below one. So the old test would say that this patient was, was healthy, would, would attain um, a steady state. Our um, reachability analysis said so too, and the patient did um, reach a good state. Let's take uh, the case of a patient for which the treatment failed, they, and we see what happens. Well, straight away we can see that the switching function doesn't go to zero at all. So, um, you know, there's no way that's going to zero. If we look at the reachability condition, we can see that the drug treatment initially looks as if it's doing the right thing. So it sends in the right direction, but it bounces out again. It's not sufficient to keep it less than zero. And in all the patients we saw for which the drug treatment didn't work, we very much saw this characteristic behavior. So this was very much a characteristic of what happened, that it bounced back and became uh, uh, positive. So um, all of the failure cases we could um, predict with good, uh, with good authority, not just knowing about the parameters, but looking at the signature, if you like, of what happened with the reachability condition. What about um, patient eight? Um, this is one of the funny types of uh, uh, where, you know, um, the di there are difficulties between analysis, clinical observation, and, and we can explain really well what happens here. Treatment is efficient as far as the clinician is concerned because the antiretroviral drugs have reduced the viral load below the level of detection. The reproductive ratio, however, is bigger than one. So their test tells them this hasn't been successful. So we've got a clinical um, observation, which would be this is below the de level of detection. I'm happy with this patient. And the test they use saying this hasn't been successful. Well, we can explain this by thinking about sliding mode control. Because if you think of what the level of detection is doing, it's putting a boundary layer. 
It's putting a boundary layer in there. So you can be below the level of detection, you can be within a boundary layer, and you cannot have re removed the effects of the viral load. And when you looked at our analysis, this is what you saw. You saw a time evolution of the, uh, of the reachability condition that was consistent with um, having a boundary layer. And so the, this one, they're both right. So the, test, the clinician is right because it's within the boundary layer. The current test is also right because it hasn't gone to the origin. It's moving within a boundary layer. So these difficulties of when we're, you know, has this been clinically um, successful or is there a problem for this patient? These patients are different. So they're not the same. It's not that it's gone to zero, as in uh, the case of, uh, 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 of the first patient. It's not the case, as in the second patient, when it's not been successful. It's somewhere in between. It's constrained, but non-zero. And the parameters of the patient tell us that. We can look at the failure cases. These are some phase portraits of the failure cases. And we can see that what happens is the outcomes are hugely different patient to patient. So what happens as a steady state for different patients where it's not successful is very different. And perhaps we would expect that. Um, healthy, very consistent. Um, so the patients for whom the drug treatment was successful, highly consistent. For the patients where it wasn't successful, highly variable. You've just got to look at the, the scales here to see the differences in dynamically uh, what, what was happening. And of course it can be, you know, as um, uh, somebody at UCL was pointing out to me, one of the reasons why some of these tra treatments are not successful, which of course isn't modeled in our system, is because people don't take their drugs as they should. So, you know, you might get the samples for them, but if they haven't been taking the drugs appropriately, then that might well be why there are some um, very different behaviors, and that's difficult to know. So I really like this study. Um, Annette Anallone, who was one of my PhD students, must take a, a lot of the credit for the hard work with the simulations. He's gone on to work with immunologists, so he's gone into a clinical setting. Um, but it's, it's a really nice piece of work, I think, because we can take biological rates from limited patient data um, at very early stages of treatment, and we can general generate personalized models of the immune system at the level of individual patients. We can also predict well. So, you know, we can look and see what happens uh, as a clinical outcome. Um, and I think it shows that control engineering systems theory has a, um, has a, a part to play in understanding disease and refining drug treatment and vaccine development. I was at a, a, a social event um, not, so, uh, not so long ago um, with someone who is involved in the drug, drug industry. So he's involved in um, developing um, pharmaceuticals. And he was saying they are recruiting as much as many physical modelers, people from a physics background these days, than they, as they are from other, from other backgrounds. So it's very much the future. And I think it's an area where we have a part to play because these are discontinuous control systems. And so the things that we do so well and we know so well are, 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 are playing a part. So I think we have a piece to offer that could be um, helpful. So I think that was everything I wanted to say. I'm happy to take questions uh, now. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it does. Um, but um, I think at the level of an individual patient, 
the degree to which that's going to impact on the dynamics of the immune response, I don't know. Um, it's certainly not modeled at, at, at the moment. I suppose the advantage of doing the um, parameter estimation at the level of individual patients, perhaps in some sense it's accommodating for this. Certainly the parameters, it isn't the case, as I, I think you, you probably imagine, that, you know, there is, and an, I, I don't know whether you've ever looked in the biological literature, but when you look at the ranges of parameters you can have in biological models compared to what we would typically allow, you know, we think like 15, 20% is a, you know, a reasonable variation. They can be like 0.1 to 100, you know, it's a very much, uh, very big variation we can have in those parameters.